Domains. Now, I know everybody watching this video knows what a domain name is. After all, you are watching this video on YouTube.com. But did you ever stop to think, how do these domains work? And more importantly, when you buy a domain, what exactly are you buying? And how can you control that domain in order to point it to your web server or your email server so that we can get email at that domain? Well, I'm going to show you, but the first thing you need to know is that a domain is really just an address book entry for an IP address. Because at a networking level, computers talk to each other using IP addresses, not domain names. And we can illustrate this if we open up a terminal or command prompt and type ping www.google.com and you see that we get back an IP address, 74.125.239.176. And if we copy and paste that into our browser, you'll see that, sure enough, we're taken to google.com, and that's because that IP address belongs to one of Google's many external facing servers at the time we made the request. And so this process of going from a domain name to an IP address is what's known as resolving a domain name. Or to put it another way, the domain name www.google.com resolves to 74.125.239.176. Now, the obvious benefit of using a domain name is it makes it easier for us humans. If we want to, say, do a Google search, we don't have to remember 74.125.2 something. We can just type in google.com. But another advantage is that it abstracts the web server, the physical machine running the web content, from the domain name. And so what this means is that if, say, you want to upgrade your web server, all you have to do is change your DNS records of your domain name and point them from the IP address of your old server to the IP address of your new server, and your users will be none the wiser. They'll keep entering yoursite.com, and the transition will just happen in the background. It asks. Specifically, it asks the DNS resolver that your device, for example, your computer or your cell phone, is using. And you can see on my machine, if I open up a browser and just type in gibberish, you can see that the domain's not found, and you can see that the error page is run by Time Warner because my ISP is Time Warner Cable. But if you want, you can go into your network settings and you can change the DNS resolver that your system is using. For example, Google runs a free DNS server that you can use instead, and if on Windows you go under your control panels and then network settings, and then click on change adapter settings, and then right click on your internet adapter and click properties. And then within that, you wanna scroll down to your TCP IP version four. And that's because all web requests transfer data over the TCP protocol. And then click on use the following DNS server address and enter 8.8.8.8 and 8.8.4.4. And those are two different IP addresses belonging to Google's DNS resolver. And if we open up a website and type in a bunch of gibberish, you see that we get a different DNS not found page. And that's because now we're using Google servers. And so we get Google's DNS not found page. So your DNS resolver asks the name servers associated with each domain in a fully qualified domain name. And I say each domain because for example, the domain www.google.com actually has four separate domains in it. And that's because each DNS entry actually ends with a period, and that's what we call the root level domain. And so assuming that nothing is cached, and I'll talk a little bit more about DNS caching at the end of the video, when your DNS resolver is resolving the domain www.google.com, it starts out by asking the root level name servers for the IP address of the name servers associated with the .com domain. And then, it asks the name servers associated with the .com domain for the IP address of the name servers belonging to the Google domain. And it's at this point in the process, if you own a domain, when you buy a domain, you're buying the right to control the response that is given by the .com name servers. And in this case, because it's Google and Google owns the domain, we're given the response of Google's name servers. We then ask Google's name servers for the IP address associated with the www subdomain. And that's when we got back our 74.125.239.176 that you saw in our ping at the beginning of the video. Well, the good news is you don't have to. When you register a domain name with a registrar, for example, GoDaddy, they'll have a name server that they'll point your domain name to by default. Of course, if you want, you could go into your GoDaddy settings and point your name servers elsewhere. But assuming that you're going to use your registrar's name servers, then they'll provide a control panel where you can go in and set your DNS records. And if you look at this Wikipedia entry for DNS records, you can see that there's actually a ton of different types of records. But for your purposes, generally, you're only going to need to worry about three. Those are the A record, the C name record, and the MX record. So let's go ahead and check out the DNS control panel that GoDaddy provides, assuming that you're using the default name servers. So go ahead and log into your account, sign in, and then launch the domains manager. And you see I have one domain registered in my account, benbeerstrom.com. And so if we open up a URL bar and put in benbeerstrom.com, you see I just have a basic portfolio page here. So let's go back to GoDaddy and we'll manage the DNS records for benbeerstrom.com. So you go ahead and click on it. 
And then inside you'll see some, one of the options that you can set is the name servers. And right now it's using GoDaddy's default name servers, the ns75.domaincontrol.com. Those are GoDaddy's default name servers that they go ahead and point your domain to when you register it. But if you wanted to, you could add custom name servers here and point it to, like I said before, Amazon Route 53. So if we go back to the control panel and we click on the DNS zone file tab, this is where you can manage your DNS records. And you can see that I have an A record pointing to the IP address 162.243.130.117. An A record is designed to provide an IP address to a DNS resolver who comes along looking for a website. And you can see I have the host set to the at parameter, which means it's specifying just benbeersham.com. No other subdomains will be forwarded to it, just the root domain. And you can see that if we open up a URL bar and paste in that IP address, that we get the same website. Now let's scroll down here to my CNAME record. And you can see here that I have it pointing to benbeersham.com. And then the host is another special symbol, the asterisk, which is a catch-all. So it means that any subdomain will point to benbeersham.com. And you saw above in the A record, we defined that benbeersham.com as pointing to the IP address beginning at 162. And so in practice, what this means is we could go to any subdomain, for example, some random subdomain.benbeersham.com, and sure enough, we're taken to the same web server. In fact, we could just enter any random string of characters and we'd still get taken to the same web server. Now, if you're gonna sign up for a Google Apps account, which will let you use Gmail's interface on your own domain, then what you'd wanna do is you'd wanna set your MX records to Google's mail servers. So here's an example of Google's mail servers. You can see that there's five different ones. In case one goes down, it'll make sure that your mail continues to go through. So we'll select to add new MX record. And again, we'll put the host to at, which means it points directly to the address that we're entering, which is aspmx.l.google.com. And then we'll set the priority and the time to live. So now any email that goes to the benbeerstrom.com domain will be forwarded onto Google's mail servers. So obviously it would be horribly inefficient if your DNS resolver had to go out and check with each one of those records every single time you hit a website. And if you look at a modern website, there's sometimes tens to even hundreds of different HTTP requests that take place to load every single page. Every image is a separate HTTP request that needs to be resolved to the domain belonging to the image. So in order to make things more efficient, the DNS system uses caching. So if we open up our A record, you can see here at the bottom, there's the TTL, which stands for time to live, which is basically telling a DNS resolver how long it should cache these DNS records for. And so what this means in practice is that if you're pointing your website from one server to another, sometimes it might take a while in order for that change to take place. And that's because your DNS record hasn't propagated to your machine. But also keep in mind that just because it has propagated on your machine and that your DNS resolver is now pointing to the new server, that doesn't necessarily mean that all your visitors are pointing to the new server as well. They are all using different DNS resolvers than you are, and it might take longer for those changes to propagate. And so it's good practice if you're switching, say, from one web server to another, after you redirect your DNS record from the old IP address to the new IP address, to go ahead and leave the old server online for a little bit of time to make sure that those records propagate to all of the DNS resolvers around the world. And sometimes that can take up to 48 hours.